Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson. Today, we're talking about being busy. Have you ever caught yourself saying, oh, I'm just so busy? Well, our guest expert today is Christine LaPerrier. Christine, welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Please, before we move on, please make sure, did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, it sounds close enough. Yes, I'm from Detroit, so we say La Perrier, but it sounds oh, pretty. Oh, La Perrier. Okay, I was thinking maybe you were from north of the border where I am, and we have this kind of uh, French spin on everything. Okay, fair enough. So <laughs> I want to read to everybody a little piece of your bio that I thought we could just unpack a little bit. Christine is a recovering workaholic, a mom of a one and a three year old, a yikes. President of Leader in Motion, leads the Advancement Center for Women of Influence, and is a published author of the best-selling book, Too Busy to Be Happy. I want to say that title again because I think that it's a really great title, Too Busy to Be Happy. Let's stop there and talk about why you wrote that book. Thank you so much for asking because this topic is near and dear to my heart. And um, (laughs) one thing I'll say is that... uh, When I sat down to think of a title for the book, my expertise, and I have more hours of practice being too busy to be happy than I do being busy and happy, which is ultimately the mission statement. So Uh, I kind of have to laugh sometimes because I'm I'm an expert in that too busy to be happy uh, mode. But my... um, my own experience, I 10 years, well, about probably 12 years now um, ago, I spent a lot of the time being that workaholic, working in management consulting, traveling to two different countries. I had a brand new team of five people reporting to me, and I had you know another team up in Toronto reporting to me. And long story short is... Um, I had a relationship that broke down and next thing you know, I, you know, I was too busy to be happy and, and it started to turn into a real physical problem. So, um, I started to have shortness of breath. I was struggling to, you know, sleep, really getting uh, kind of a new level of depression and kind of really down in the dumps. And what I noticed is that I would just keep working harder. I would just keep working harder to try to somehow overcome the obstacles, thinking that that was going to make everything better. And before long, I was, um, you know, in my doctor's office dealing with some real serious health issues, and I was going through a full-fledged burnout. So, I think it's a topic that we don't talk about enough, Mm -hmm. and I'm really passionate about it because anybody that's really committed to doing great work uh, in their personal life and in their professional life, a lot of the times can run into this roadblock. I hear you. And and okay, let's talk just a, a brief moment about having a one and a three-year-old, and yes. yet you're probably traveling and doing all these things. So speak a little bit about that in terms of your busyness and happiness. Well, it's a great point because um, my experience of burnout came years before my children were on this planet. And um, And today I find that the tools and techniques that I talk about in the book are even 10 times more important to me than before. So, I mean, the level... Where would you have been if you had kept trying to dig to China like you were, just getting more and more into your work when you weren't healthy and kind of balanced in your own life, right? Right. And that's the thing is that you know so many things are going on in a day from the minute that we wake up to the minute we go to bed. And if there's no conscious awareness of what that stress level feels like, and there's no conscious awareness of any kind of tools or practices to actually help you bring things back into order again, I feel like we become experts in being unhappy and just keeping on the treadmill as as the best we know how. And I'm really worried about that. I think it's a cultural issue. I think, you know, we've got... um, very cluttered minds, like with, between social media, between the expectations we put on ourselves. We're all, we also have access to seeing people that seem to have the perfect life. So we're seeing, you know, lots and lots of pictures and we're inundated with messages all the time saying that we're still not enough. We still have more things to strive for. And I just feel like a lot of people that I know, and I coach uh, about a hundred different professionals a year. And I would say 
it's at least 60% of the time I'm having conversations with people that just feel overwhelmed. And, you know, even though they're uh, making great money and they're, you know, they have these great sounding careers, they're really genuinely not happy. Right, right. Okay, so let's say you're on the line with someone who is genuinely overwhelmed. What would be some, uh, where would you begin? Would you do an audit, an assessment or something just to kind of check in and find out exactly where they are? Yeah, well, I've come up with this term. I nickname it emotional real estate. And it's one of the key concepts in the book. And what I would say is, if you think of your brain as being the house, in front of your brain, there's this thing. I nicknamed it kind of your front lawn. And it's this fixed amount of real estate that you have to process and focus on change that's happening in your life, emotional baggage, things from the past, things from the future, things that are going on in the present moment, uh, decisions that you need to make, procrastination, relationships that are using up energy. So you have this fixed amount of emotional real estate to use up or to be thinking about all those things. And what I find is everything that's using up emotional real estate is what blocks you from the street, which is, I kind of nickname, that's where present, that's where being present sits, right? Mm. So many of us are trying to figure out how to meditate or be more mindful. And I guess because of my, um, I'm an engineer by trade. So I need, I needed a logical way to get get to mindfulness. Uh, (laughs) Because you, you were being blocked by the front lawn and you couldn't get there. I mean, no amount of meditation, if you didn't make some decisions and get clear some of the clutter on your front lawn, would you be able to get there? Wow. Exactly. Oh, there's so much in here. I'm so excited. This is a lot to unpack. Okay. So that, you know, one thing I just want to note as speakers, we are often aware of how a visual painting a picture can be really helpful for people to really lock in our ideas. You could have said that a completely different way and it wouldn't have been as visual. I am visual visualizing the street. That's my goal is to get there into a nice zen state (laughs) but if i have and and what do you think about you know let's talk about the front lawn a little bit how do you clean up your front lawn that's a great question because that's a big focus in the book so it's first to start to realize you know i kind of have nicknamed this book the marie kondo book for the mind it's the flattery of the mind that's great (laughs) that's so good Someone who read it made the comment, it's Marie Kondo meets Brene Brown with a twist of uh, eat, pray, love on the side. Like a oh, the side. Geez, all of those are my favorite people. So of course, yep. it's very attractive to me. Okay. Big compliment. So what I was going to say though, so you have this front lawn and I think one of the things you start to realize when you realize, you know, the thoughts that are using up emotional real estate for you, you really only have three options. So A, you can keep thinking that thought over and over again. So you can hold on to it. Right. B, you can make peace with it and let it go. Or C, you can take action on it. And sometimes just taking action or scheduling action against something that's on your mind can take it off your mind. So if you think of it, it actually simplifies everything that's going on in our head. So if I were to walk through and say, okay, give me an inventory of every single thought that you are thinking all the way through, what keeps you up at night? You know, when you roll over in the middle of the night and your brain starts to wander, Mm -hmm. what are those thoughts? And so I might work with a client and say, okay, let's do an inventory, like you said, around all the things that are using up emotional real estate. And then let's start to see where can we simplify some of this thinking do a little bit of re-engineering of some thinking and see how we can start to make that feel lighter and a little easier to navigate. I love it. I have a uh, big giant post-it notes, um, you know, the ones that are like flip chart sizes. And sometimes I call that my bugaboo list, like there's things that are annoying me. They're pissing me off. (laughs) This is my bugaboo list. So I like this idea. So I have three choices when it comes to my list. I can hold on. Right. Uh, And a lot of people seem to like holding on. So maybe we need to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I can make peace with it or I can take action. And even if I take some action at a future time, but I put it, I put it on my schedule. Whew. I can start to release a little bit of anxiety around it. Exactly. And something as simple as, you know, I might have a client who's having a difficult relationship with their boss. We might clarify the conversation around that difficult relationship with their boss. And then we might set a schedule. We might say, okay, if, you know, right now it's May, 
if by June 30th, this issue doesn't resolve with the current strategy, we're going to have a heart to heart with them, you know, on the week of, you know, June 30th. And we might book it in the calendar and set an action plan against it. And what it does is it lifts the space. It lifts the need to keep thinking about it and processing. So something as simple as a, you know, difficult relationship, we can actually set an action item against it. Or we can look at what beliefs do we need to make true in order for you to let go and make peace with that. I love it. And you know what's really funny? One of my friends, Rob, he did, I don't think he listens to the podcast, so I can share his story. <laughs> He's from my coaching group. He was afraid. I don't know why, but it took him eight years to fire his bookkeeper who really should have been gone, you know, seven years sooner. And when he did it, she just picked up her stuff and left and said, okay, see ya. And that was it. There was zero drama around it. And he waited eight years to do it. Right. So if there's someone in your life that maybe in our cases, professional speakers, you know, we, we can hit bugaboos when it comes to hiring web designers. I just went through that and we had to kind of replace one with another and move on and get the project across the finish line. Can't that be, you know, something that drains a lot of mental energy? Right. And sometimes, you know, it's a great question. Like that example, you know, I love to say, okay, weigh out your emotional real estate against your budget and also weigh it out against the time that you're going to spend. And instead of making decisions based on time and money alone, make, make your decisions based off of emotional real estate, time and uh, money. So So good. You know, it's so cool because if you think of it as a business owner, what happens is sometimes we'll go with the you know, oh, I can't afford the, let's say, expensive consultant or the higher priced web designer. I'm going to go with the cheap one. But guess what? That one ends up using seven times more emotional real estate to manage than the more expensive one that knows their business inside and out. So, you know, I think about that all the time. That's really good. And I'm going to layer onto that. This is a side, this is a little squirrel hole that I'll take our listeners on. I'm also uh, talking to my tribe all the time about making decisions from the place where you want to be. So if you want to be earning 250K a year as a speaker, you would make your decision from the 250K speaker place rather than from the place that is fearful of the financials of it. And, And so you're kind of, we're just, I'm giving a little extra layer. It's not really related, but, um, Hey, let me ask you this. What do you, do you have something that you talk about in relationship to your morning routine? Like how do you get your day started in a way that it doesn't see it spiraling out of control? I do. I have in the book a seven minute routine that I absolutely love. So what I find is that having a one and a three year old, I don't have (laughs) these amazing hours of free time in the morning to uh, level set and meditate and do my exercise, all those great things that we know probably help people get their day off the ground. And so I came across someone who was talking about a seven minute routine. And even though I didn't love their version of it, I created my own and it's in the book, but it's so easy. When I start going with seven minutes, I can set my phone and I can do 60 second timers on every single minute of the process. And it's a seven minute process. It's really, really easy. And I actually work with clients a lot of the times where I'll say, okay, I want you to try this. So if you get into your office at 8.30, 8.30 to 8.40, I want you to book that time aside and just run through this seven minute routine. Okay. And a couple of things that it, it encompasses, it's one, mo- one minute of quiet. So one minute of quiet, most of us don't get a lot of it, but we can, even that alone can feel like it can, yeah, it's just, (laughs) it's amazing. It can feel like bliss and, and to set the alarm just so that I have no choice, but to sit there until the alarm goes off. It's kind of funny how I realize one minute of silence can do so much. The second is I I like to look at um, moments to savor. And this is actually really healthy for me right now with my one and three-year-olds because they can be so busy and so hectic. And, you know, I've got one that's teething right now. And Uh, what I find is moments to savor is a replay of the last 24 hours. And what are the best moments of those last 24 hours? So it's a form of gratitude, but I found that um, sometimes just replaying the last 24 hours and going back to, you know, my son was giggling, like 
belly laughing yesterday and it was so cute. And it was in between these miserable spells of teething. And I thought to myself, there's my moment to save her oh, right there. Beautiful. This beautiful little belly laugh that I got, <laughs> you know, just, and he was so giggly and so joyous for this little period of time. I'm going to, that's going to be one of my moments to save her. Oh, and then I, I might go through. Yeah. That's awesome. We actually focus a lot. I have a, um, a journal, the wealthy speaker, daily success planner and journal. And we focus a lot on gratitude in the journal as a great way to kind of start your day in a place of giving rather than, you know, what can I get out of my day today? Uh, I love that. That's fantastic. Uh, Really good seven minutes. So I think people should go and grab this book, Too Busy to Be Happy, so that you can, um, can hear all of the other things that you should be doing in those seven minutes. Um, Oh, okay. So here's a question for you. I think some people are going to giggle at this one. Uh, Do you have any advice for the person who uses up a ton of emotional real estate worrying about what everybody thinks? I love this question. This is my favorite (laughs) because um, I coach some really high powered women on their own careers. And one of the things um, that will happen is that they'll be working so hard, but they'll usually run up against someone that they can't make happy. And it can use a lot of emotional real estate for that coworker that you've tried really hard to impress with a project Mm -hmm. you're working on or that boss that you run up to. And, you know, in your career, you've done amazing. And now, now you're getting kind of a a cold block. Uh, So I've nicknamed it the bell curve of approval. I talk about this in the book, but it's basically, if you remember the bell curves from when you were in Mm -hmm. school. Yes. I've nicknamed the bell curve of approval by the people that approve of you or give you back that positive feedback. So what I always say is, you know, in in any single one of us, if we interface with 100 people, the top 20% are going to think we're fabulous. They're our tribe. They get us. They get our messaging. The middle 60 are going to think we're pretty cool, but we're not the best thing since sliced bread. And then that bottom 20%, no matter how good you are, no matter who you are, no matter how... It just not, it's not going to happen. My joke is I'm a redhead. So I always joke that, you know, that person got beat up by a redhead when they were a kid. (laughs) They're traumatized. (laughs) It's not in my control. And there's somebody that's just not going to get you. And as soon as you make peace with the fact that this is just the physics, um, it allows you to be authentic, number one. And it allows you to go back to dialing up the sound of that top 20% instead of, you know, hearing at blaring uh, you know, volume, the bottom 20%. And I think so many people, when they see that shift, all of a sudden they can make peace going back to how we get rid of things on our emotional real estate. We can make peace with not making somebody happy. If we just simply know that they're, they're probably going to be in the bottom 20% of our bell curve. I really want people to not only take in what you're saying and drop that 20% and not laser in on that one feedback form that doesn't say what you think it should say, but also I want them to listen to how you have named all of your ideas. This is such an important thing for speakers to be doing. And so I'm kind of doing a lot of little sidebars here. I apologize for that if anybody's getting... um, uh, it, taking uh, offense to my squirrel, my squirrel tirades here, but uh, I really love the bell curve of approval. And, you know, we had, um, I did a, a program just for women, and I think there was six women in the room, and one of them had to leave before the weekend was over. I, I just knew that I would never, ever, ever be able to make her happy. And when that happened, the whole rest of the room just relaxed. It was like such a blessing and the whole rest of the year was a nice thing. And, uh, but whoa, it, it's very difficult. I'm hoping nobody ever has to go through that because that was a painful time. But uh, yeah, just let it go. It's so much easier that way. You know, and this is a really funny story. It's right on point with what you were saying. I was teaching another speaker. I actually um, lead a lot of programs for one of the big banks. And I had another facilitator within me or with me in the room one day and I was doing some training with her and I was running a session with 25 women in the room. And at one point, one woman got very upset and got up and walked out. And I, I kind of chased her down the hall really quick. And I said, Hey, I just want to check in with you and find out what's going on for you right now. And she said, the style of workshop that we were doing, it forced her to improvise a lot and talk about herself with strangers, which she found uncomfortable. And she said, for me, this just isn't working. I like to be prepared. I like to know what I'm going to say. And I'm finding this really 
uh, invokes a lot of anxiety out of me. I said, hey, completely cool. I just wanted to make sure that there was nothing I said that personally offended you or anything. And she said, no, it's just, this is not working for me. Cool enough. So off she went and I walked back in and kept running the program and the person I was coaching, you know, she said to me as we left, she goes, wow, I just can't believe how you stayed so calm during that. She goes, that would have really ruffled me in front of a room. And I said, you know what? I said, bell, bell curve of approval, baby. Like, you know, yeah. I, I can make a lot of people happy. I can't make everyone happy. And if I had tried to structure the program to match her personality type, mm -hmm. it would have been inauthentic. And I would have, I would have still pushed somebody else into the bottom 20% because somebody else right. wouldn't have liked the way that I was doing it. So I just have to honor my, my best voice is definitely going to help that top 20. This is like your get out of jail free card, everybody. I mean, really take it out of being about you and just, this just isn't, he's just not that into you is one of my favorite books when I was single. And that took the same, it was exactly the same yep. concept. Yep. <laughs> the bell curve of approval. Just not that into you. Um, when you're coaching clients, what are some of the things that you suggest uh, they try when they're just kind of starting to get going here? So I like to look at, you know, again, that inventory and start to pitch through, for instance, is there an empowering thought? So if something's really driving a lot of anxiety, how do we find, it, find an empowering thought that you can move towards? So, you know, I started uh, this business about 11 years ago. And one of the things that I found is um, going into sales meetings, I used to get really anxious, for instance, that would use up a lot of emotional real estate for me. Right. So my empowering thought became, may I attract clients that I can serve with my best talent? Ooh. I only want to attract clients that I can serve with my best talent. So it's okay if a sales meeting doesn't go well, I only want to attract clients that I can serve with my best talent. And so I made this my empowering belief and using that, even when I get into the car and I sit down and I'm, you know, I'm, I've pulled up and I'm parked in front of that uh, corporate building and I'm going in for that big sales discussion, mm -hmm. just staying really focused on that intention. Or if I'm speaking to a large room of people and I'm a little nervous, I might mm -hmm. stay, you know, I might come back to, there's one person in the room that really needs me today yeah. and I'm here for them. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to make a hundred people happy, but I'm here to blow one person's mind. And I just make that my intention. And it really is my empowering thought. It, it brings me back to service and it helps me stay it. out of fear. I love it. And basically you're building your perfect client right into that, uh, thought. There's a book that I uh, have recommended in my book uh, called Attracting Your Perfect Customers, The Power of Strategic Synchronicity. And it's all about just attracting the people who are right for you. We're talking about the bell curve, letting go of the 20% at the bottom. And how beautiful is that to just say, okay, I guess we're not a really good fit on this one. That's cool. Right. Yeah. Next. Thank you. Next. <laughs> it's the only way that you'll ever have enough emotional real estate though, to really build a business, because that's what I think we're both pointing to is that worrying about that bottom 20% eats up so much energy and so much emotional real estate that you won't get out of bed and go keep going when you get that kind of uh, rejection. And so what really good, you know, tenured business owners seem to know is they know how to see that stuff and process it quickly and keep moving forward. Yeah. And I, I would even add, you know, one thing I did just at the start of my business is it was 2008. And I don't know if anybody Yikes. saw that <laughs> right? there was a lot going on. And yeah. I used to watch that um, watching the news for me used up a lot of emotional oh, real estate. Yes. I'd get into my office and think to myself, what, what am I doing? I must be out yeah. to lunch trying to start a business in this economy. And you know what? I realized that that didn't serve me. So I turned off that newscast and I kind of stayed focused on positive podcasts that had a lot of positive energy in them. And yeah use that as my point of reference because I needed the emotional real estate to keep pushing that's, to get things done. That's really good. Did you live in Michigan then? No, I actually had already moved to Toronto, but okay. um, so there was a lot going on. Family in Michigan were all impacted by that. That would have been rough, a rough time to be in the United States and in, in Michigan. Like that right. A rough, very rough time. Um, one of the coaches that I listen to says, double down on what is working. So let's say if you're a speaker and you have uh, 
gotten, you know, maybe you look back over your last six client interactions, four that went well, two that did not. Let's double down on the four, the types that were the four and let go of the ones that uh, aren't the right fit for you because, and even when you get out there and you know you're standing in front of the wrong audience, you know, let that go and be a lesson to you and don't try to fix it. Move on to the right audience. Absolutely. And, you know, even on that, I just, I, I, I'm smiling over here while you're talking because it's, uh, it's bringing back, you know, I had a speaking engagement. I, I was speaking at a couple different sessions within one large organization. And I was so worried about twisting myself into a knot to deliver the perfect content. And I did the first session on a Tuesday and it did not go well. And I was so disappointed. I walked out of there and I actually called my coach. And within a couple seconds, I was in tears because of just what happened that didn't go well. And I had another session lined up for Thursday. And I thought, oh my God, I don't think I can do another session um, when that just went so poorly. Right. So long story short is I talked to her and she said, I want you to come back to what you know for sure. Mm -hmm. What are the things you can speak about with conviction that you know for sure, undeniable, um, and don't worry so much about trying to twist yourself into the knot, but more the focus on what do you, what can you say with conviction that, you know, you know, for sure. And so I, I threw out the first uh, engagement. I, I basically deep, deep sixed the entire strategy, mm-hmm. built a new deck. I had five pictures, five things that I know for sure, walked in and spoke at the Thursday session and I got a standing ovation. And it was so much less emotional real estate to speak about the things that I knew for sure and I was passionate about instead of trying to twist myself into the perfect speaker for an audience. That is is such an eye-opener. I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there who have done that. I've certainly had clients, one of my most successful clients, we have had at least one and possibly even two of these uh, conversations where things just did not go well at all. And so how do you get back on the horse, right? How do you go back to any, not even the same like group of people, but another completely different audience. And so we talked about coming from a place of service. How can I serve these people rather than being all up in your head about, you know, what's going on with me? How can I serve these people? And you figured out what you knew the best. And that's how you pulled it out of the fire. Way to go. That's awesome. There you go. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, we've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything that we haven't covered that you think is really important? I think what I would just encourage people at the end of the day, when they read this book, the thing that I want people to think about is their personal work-life wisdom. So my Instagram and uh, website are myworklifewisdom.com and or at myworklifewisdom. And the purpose is for everybody to find their own unique rhythm of what works for their work-life wisdom. So for instance, right now in my life, getting up at five in the morning to exercise uses more emotional real estate. When I go to bed at night, I'm laying there worried about when the alarm goes off because that uses a lot of emotional real estate. Somebody else, it could be a completely different thing where that feels really good to them and they, they get that out of the way in the morning. So the, the mission statement is for you to notice what uses up a lot of emotional real estate. What are the things, you know, I, I even joke, I can speak in front of 500 people in a week that uses very little emotional real estate. But if I have to do taxes, <laughs> I, you know, you'll watch me, I'll be eating cookies and trying to self-soothe and, you know, all these things, these bad habits, procrastinating, because I find that that's outside of my instinct. So I've gotten really conscious of A, trying to figure out where can I delegate things that use up a lot of emotional real estate? Where can I book things that use a lot of energy for me at times when I have a lot of power? So usually I'm pretty strong in the day from about 10 to probably three or four in the afternoon are kind of my power hours. Yeah. So I try to get, you know, if I have something administrative that's going to, you know, I have a proposal to write, I might write that during my power hours instead of pushing it till the end of the day when I'm really tired. And I I then have already used up a lot of my emotional real estate. So um, just to customize the way that your energy works and become really aware of it is a powerful tool. So I'd like to encourage everybody today to think about that. Fantastic. All right. If people want to, where's the best place for them to go uh, go and buy uh, Too Busy to Be Happy? They can buy that on Amazon or iBooks. Okay, great. Easy, Easy to find. Awesome. Well, Christine, thank you so much for your time. Uh, 
our listeners I know have probably taken a whole host of notes and I'll apologize for my squirrel trails that I let us down a few places here today. Great. Thank you, Christine, for your time. Most uh, appreciated. And for those of you who have enjoyed the Wealthy Speaker podcast, uh, please tell your friends, hey, we want to spread the word about the podcast and let everybody know. Send them on over to iTunes to check it out. And with that, we will say, see you soon, Wealthy Speakers. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Wealthy Speaker Show. Please visit speakerlauncher.com for your free Wealthy Speaker audit and visit speakerlauncher.com forward slash podcast for show notes and many more resources to help you catapult your speaking business. See you soon, Wealthy Speakers.